Hi everyone and welcome back to MGT4520. Today we are going to be discussing international legal concerns. The objectives set out for today are to determine methods for operating in a country with respect to its legal and political system. We're also going to try and understand the impact of morality and ethics in global business understand the various types of legal and regulatory systems, as well as assess the level of corruption and bribery in a foreign country. This leads to learning the elements of political risk, which will obviously depend on the country that you're looking at expanding into or the country that you are originating in. It's important that you as a global entrepreneur to understand that each country has its own set of laws. It has its own political systems and it has its own rules in terms of economic commerce. And it's important to remember that ignorance is not a legal defense. So just because you are not aware of it doesn't mean that it does not exist. So it's up to you to brief yourself and familiarize yourself with the legal systems in the countries that you are operating within. Be sure to assess each, each country's policies and stability. This is also known as political risk analysis. And there's three major types of political risk. You have operating risk, which is interference. Now you might be able to transfer the risk, which is the second option. And this is part of shifting your assets out of a country. And the third major political risk is ownership risk, where country takes over company assets and or your employees. We now shift to political activity and the two key topics here are trade sanctions and export controls and regulations of global business behavior. Trade sanctions and export controls are regulatory measures used by countries or international organizations to achieve foreign policy and national security objectives. Here's a brief explanation. So trade sanctions these are penalties imposed by one country on another, often to discourage the latter from engaging in certain activities that the former finds objectionable. Now, sanctions can take various forms, including tariffs, barriers to trade, import and export quotas, and restrictions on financial transactions. They are used to exert economic pressure on a nation or group to influence political or military actions. For example, a country might impose sanctions on another to deter human rights abuses or aggression against another country. Whereas the second topic, export controls, now these are government imposed restrictions on the export of certain goods, technologies, and data for reasons including national security, foreign policy, or economic protection. Export controls can prevent the dissemination of sensitive technologies that could be used in weapons development, cyber espionage, or other activities that might compromise a nation's security. They require companies to obtain licenses for certain exports and comply with a list of regulations and procedures. Shifting over to regulations of global business behavior, this refers to the rules and standards that govern how companies operate in the global marketplace. These regulations can cover a wide range of issues, including anti-corruption measures, environmental standards, labor rights, and fair competition laws. Businesses operating internationally must navigate a complex web of local and international laws that dictate how they can behave in different jurisdictions. For example, the Foreign Corruption Practices Act, or also known as the FCPA in the United States, prohibits companies from bribing foreign officials to obtain or retain business. Adherence to these regulations is crucial for businesses to maintain their reputations, avoid legal penalties, and contribute to the sustainable and ethical development of global commerce. Collectively, this is what shapes the political activity through trade sanctions and export controls, as well as regulations of global business behavior. Now, looking at trade sanctions and export controls, trade sanctions are government actions against the free flow of goods and services or even ideas for political purposes. 
Now, export controls restrict the flow of specified goods and services to a country. Technology has made it increasingly difficult to enforce these restrictions, though. An example of trade sanctions could be the sanctions imposed by the United States and the European Union on Russia following its annexation of Crimea in 2014. These sanctions included asset freezes and travel bans on individuals and companies, restrictions on trade, and access to financial markets and services. These sanctions aim to pressure Russia politically to deter further aggressive actions. For export controls, an example would be the U.S. restrictions on the export of advanced computing technologies to certain countries. For instance, the United States, through the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security, BIS, may require companies to obtain a license before exporting certain high-performance computer chips or other sensitive technology. The reason for this is to prevent the use of this technology in military programs that could threaten national and global security. The statement that technology has made it increasingly difficult to enforce these restrictions refers to the challenges posed by the digital age, where goods, services, and ideas can be tr transmitted across borders instantly via the internet. For instance, software and blueprints for advanced technology can be shared online bypassing traditional export controls. Additionally, cryptocurrencies and other digital financial instruments can make it harder to track and control the flow of funds related to sanctioned entities. Taking all of this information regarding political risk under consideration, global entrepreneurs must manage and mitigate political risks, and this can be done in three different ways either ownership risk, where it's the possibility of loss of property and life, operating risk, where interference in the ongoing operations in a foreign country, where countries can impose new controls and prices, production or restrict access to resources or labor markets. Or third, you can transfer the risk, which affects the movement of funds within a country or between countries, including currency restrictions. Beyond political risk, we have legal considerations and regulations, and there are four foundations of law. Common law, which is English law, typically used in Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. You have civil law, otherwise known as Roman law, in France, Spain, Japan, and Brazil. We also have Islamic law, where the Quran and Prophet Muhammad is endorsed in Islamic countries. Socialist law, also known as Marxist, is used in China, Cuba, the Democratic Republic of North Korea, and Russia. Part of the legal protections through the legal system is intellectual property, where patents, copyright, trademark, and trade secrets are protected. Not all countries have the same legal protections, and enforceability of contract laws vary depending on the country. Be clear about what country would enforce the contract. Now, patents, for example, a patent is a form of intellectual property protection that gives its owner the legal right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention for a limited period of years in exchange for publishing an enabling public disclosure of the invention. Patents are usually granted to inventions that are new, useful, and non-obvious. An example is a pharmaceutical company might receive a patent for a new drug compound that treats a particular disease, which would prevent other companies from producing or selling that compound without permission. Now, copyright, this type of protection is for authors of original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and certain other intellectual works, both published and unpublished. Copyright gives the author or owner the exclusive right to reproduce, distribute, perform, display, or license the work. An example of this is an author writes a novel and publishes it. Copyright law protects the author's right to control who can make copies of the book or create derivative works based on its story. Moving to trademarks, now a trademark is a sign capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one enterprise from those of another enterprise. 
trademarks are protected by intellectual property rights. Now, an example of this, as shown in this slide, is the Golden Arches, which are a registered trademark of McDonald's. This sign distinguishes their products and services from those of other fast food companies. Now, the fourth component, trade secrets, is a formula, practice, process, design, instrument, pattern, or compilation of information, which is not generally known or reasonable, ascertainable, by which a business can obtain an economic advantage over competitors or customers. It is protected without registration as long as the business keeps it confidential. Now, an example of this is the recipe for Coca-Cola, which is one of the most famous trade secrets and is known by only a few people within the organization. Now, as for the legal protections and the enforceability of contract laws, not all countries have the same legal protections for these forms of intellectual property. For example, some countries may not recognize patents for certain types of software, or they may have different durations for copyright protection. The enforceability of contract laws refers to whether a particular jurisdiction will uphold the terms of a contract, which can include licenses or agreements related to IP. Contract laws vary significantly between countries, and some may have more rigorous enforcement mechanisms than others. So when, enter when entering into an international contract, it is critical to specify which country's laws will govern the contract and which country's courts will have jurisdiction in case there is a dispute. This helps ensure that all the parties involved know where and how legal issues related to the contract can be resolved. A perfect example of this is a software development contract between a US company and a German company might state that any legal disputes will be settled in accordance with the laws of the state of California in the United States of America, and that any lawsuits will be filed in the appropriate court within California. That is intellectual property. Safety and liability in the context of international business can be complex due to the varying legal protections across different countries. Here's an elaboration on the points mentioned here. Number one being not all countries have the same legal protection. Legal systems vary widely across the globe and what is protected in one country may not be in another. For example, some countries may have strong intellectual property laws, whereas others may have weaker protections or enforcement mechanisms. This discrepancy can affect the safety of business operations and the protection of assets, including intellectual property and trade secrets. When a company operates internationally, it must understand and navigate the legal landscape of each country in which it does business to ensure its operations and assets are legally protected. Looking at the second point, be clear about what country would enforce the contract. Again, as we discussed in the previous slide, in international contracts, it's crucial to specify the governing law and jurisdiction. That is, which country's laws apply to the contract and which country's courts have the authority to enforce it. This is also known as choice of law or form selection clause. Without such a clause, there could be significant uncertainty and risk in the event of a dispute. For example, again, with a contract between a US company and a German company, if the dispute that any legal disputes will be resolved under the contracts of the United Kingdom and in the courts of London, this ensures that both parties know that the rules and procedures that will govern any potential disagreements will occur in that court system. The third point, what standards are you going to follow? Now, this is looking at, you know, companies must decide which standards they will adhere to in their operations, especially when they span multiple jurisdictions with different regulations. Standards could relate to product quality, safety, environmental impact, labor practices, and significantly more. For instance, a multinational corporation may choose to follow the ISO standard, which is International Organization for Standardization, to ensure quality and safety across all its operations, even if local, re local regulations are less stringent. 
Now, this can help maintain consistency, ensure compliance in cross-border operations, and manage liability risk. Another point to this is it also might help with your value proposition and the branding of the company, ensuring that people are safe. By considering these factors, businesses can better manage their international operations, minimizing risks, and ensuring they both meet their legal obligations and their own standards for safety and liability. Another aspect of legal protection is the non-disclosure agreement. Now, a non-disclosure agreement, often referred to as an NDA, is a confidentiality agreement it is a legally binding contract between two or more parties where the subject of the agreement is a promise that information conveyed will be maintained in secrecy. Here's how NDAs relate to the points provided. So for the first point, protect trade secrets not covered by law. Now, trade secret laws protect against unauthorized use of valuable business information where an NDA can provide an additional layer of protection. Trade secrets are not covered by law until they are misappropriated, but an NDA can prevent the disclosure of such information in the first place. For example, an NDA can cover prototypes, business strategies, or algorithms that are not patented or patentable, but are valuable to a company's competitive advantage. Now, looking at the second point, protect the company. Now, by, restriction, by restricting the disclosure of sensitive information, NDAs protect the company from potential losses that could occur if that information were leaked to competitors or the public. An NDA ensures that employees, contractors, and other third parties who have access to confidential information cannot legally share it, which means safeguarding the company's interests and market position. Now, the third point, sensitive information. NDAs are used when parties must share sensitive information they want to keep out of the public domain. This can include financial data, customer lists, technical specifications, and other proprietary knowledge. Now, by signing an NDA, recipients of the information are legally bound to not disclose it to any outside of the terms of that agreement. The definition of sensitive information is usually clearly outlined within the NDA to ensure all parties understand what is considered confidential. Now, in practice, an NDA should be clear about the scope of the confidential information, the duration of the confidentiality obligation, and the obligations of the receiving party which include the consequences of breaching that agreement. It is critical tool it is sorry it is a critical tool for companies to protect their intellectual property and business secrets in the absence of or in conjunction with other legal protections. Now licensing is a business arrangement that allows one party, the licensee, to use the intellectual property of another party, the licensor in exchange for payment, which is often in the form of royalties. Here's a more detailed explanation based on the points provided. Agreement between two parties where one party has proprietary rights on some information, process, or technology by a patent, trademark, or copyright. A licensing agreement is a partnership between the IP rights holder, licensor, and a party who wants to use these rights. Again, licensee. This agreement grants the licensee permission to use the intellectual property under specific conditions set forth in the contract without transferring the ownership of the IP. Now, looking at specified in a contract, the terms of use, including the scope of the license, the duration, the financial arrangement, and the, any restrictions are detailed in a legal document. This contract specifies what the licensee can and cannot do with the intellectual property. The territories where the IP can be used and the time period for which these rights are granted. The third point, licensor versus licensee. The licensor is the owner of the IP who grants the license and the licensee is the one who receives the right to use the IP. Royalties are payments made by the licensee to the licensor. 
typically calculated as a percentage of revenues or a fixed amount per unit sold. The royalty rate is usually agreed upon in the licensing agreement. Now, the fourth point, significant value to grow in new markets when resources or knowledge is lacking. Licensing is often used as a strategy to enter new markets without the need for significant investment in manufacturing or marketing. It can provide a company with immediate access to existing products, trademarks, or the technological know-how that they may lack, which enables them to scale up quickly and efficiently. Now, the fifth point can also be problematic. Licensing agreements can lead to various issues if not properly managed. There can be disputes over the scope of the licensed rights, the quality of the products or services produced by the licensee, or the accuracy of royalty reports and payments. There's also the risk of IP dilution if the licensee doesn't maintain the brand standards set by the licensor, or if the IP is over licensed. Now, the licensor must be vigilant to ensure that the licensing doesn't infringe on their ability to exploit the IP or conflict with other agreements. Now, summarizing this all together, licensing can be a powerful tool for both licensors and licensees, offering opportunities of growth and market expansion. However, it requires careful contract arrangements and ongoing management to protect the interests of both parties and ensuring the success of the licensing partnership. Now drawing from the political aspects, drawing from the legal aspects, it, it now gets to a position of business ethics and morality. And business ethics refers to the moral principles that guide the way a business behaves. And again, we differentiate business ethics in terms of what society determines is appropriate or is good versus morality, which is our own internal interpretation of what is right or wrong or what is moral or what is just. So the same behavior may be perceived differently in different cultures and markets. So it's important to have a clear understanding of business ethics in a global context, especially in the countries you're looking to do business in. So let's look at these points a little bit more in depth. Ethical standards, right? So ethics is not interpreted the same. Ethical standards and behaviors are not universal. They, universal. they vary widely between cultures, countries, and even industries. For instance, the practice of giving gifts to business partners may be considered as a gesture of goodwill in one culture, but in another, it may be seen as bribery. So companies must understand and respect these differences when operating in international markets. So what is your standard? Each company must define its own ethical standards, which should align with its values and the expectations of its stakeholders. And again, this isn't just for large companies. It's also for micro size, zero to four employees, small companies, five to 99 employees, medium sized companies. Morality and ethics is important for all business sizes. These standards serve as a guideline for decision making and behavior within the company. Now, the company should clearly articulate its ethical standards to all employees and partners to ensure that they are understood and implemented consistently. The third point, how will your native country customers perceive your behavior? So when a company operates globally, the perceptions of its customers in its home country can be impacted by its behavior in other markets. Now, an example of this is if a company is seen as exploiting workers in a foreign country, such as a few years back with regarding to Nike and child labor, even if it's legal in that jurisdiction, customers in the home country may view this negatively, which can affect the company's reputation and sales. So this leads us to, you know, should be based on three basic values, integrity, transparency, and accountability. Now this integrity, we're looking at the importance of acting with honesty and honor without compromising the truth. You, your company, 
You should adhere to their values and to do the right thing, even when it's not legally required or when no one is watching. Whereas transparency, businesses should be open in their operations, willing to share information with its stakeholders. This includes being clear about their decision-making processes, financials, and other aspects of the business. Now, the point of transparency is to help build trust with customers, employees, and the public, which then leads us to accountability. Companies should take responsibility for their actions and their impact on all stakeholders, including your employees, your customers, your communities, and the environment. When, mistake ha when mistakes happen, they should take corrective action and work to prevent them in the future. Okay, so business ethics requires a nuanced understanding of different cultural norms and a commitment to maintaining high ethical standards. This includes setting clear ethical guidelines for behavior, understanding how actions are perceived across different cultures, and grounding business practices in integrity, transparency, and accountability. Now, corruption in business often refers to practices that involve the misuse of power for private gain. Three concepts mentioned here are interconnected within the broader discussion of corruption. So reasonable way of doing business is the ethical business practices dictating that companies operate in a manner that is fair, legal and honest. This includes following laws and regulations, competing fairly, and engaging in transactions that are above board. A reasonable way of doing business excludes corrupt practices and implies making decisions that are not only legal, but also ethically sound. Bribery, now this is the act of offering, giving, receiving, or soliciting something of value as a means of influencing the actions of an official or other person in charge of a public or legal duty. Now, bribery is a common form of corruption and is illegal in most jurisdictions. It undermines the principles of fair competition and often leads to suboptimal outcomes for businesses and consumers. It can also damage a company's reputation and results in significant legal pen penalties. Now, the third point, quid pro quo, the literal meaning is something for something in Latin. Now, this term refers to a situation where something is given or accepted in exchange for something else. In the context of corruption, it often describes a scenario where an official or employee might offer preferential treatment in exchange for a bribe. So quid pro quo arrangements are typically covert and unlawful as they involve a misuse of authority for personal gain. Corruption can distort markets, reduce the quality of products and services, increase costs and results in unfair advantages. It also carries significant legal and reputational risks. So companies may face severe penalties under laws like the Foreign Corruption Practices Act, FCPA in the United States, or the UK Bribery Act, which have extraterritorial reach meaning they can prosecute corrupt practices committed abroad by nationals or companies based in those countries. So to combat corruption, many companies implement rigorous compliance programs, conduct regular training for employees and establish clear policies and procedures for ethical behavior. These steps help to create a culture of integrity, transparency and accountability within the organization. Thank you for joining me today on the aspects of political and legal components of international entrepreneurship. We had a fairly good discussion on ethics and morality and how that plays into the day-to-day -day operations of companies, not only in our home countries, but also abroad. Another thing to bear in mind is, again, when we're looking at exporting and we're looking at working within these other countries, what are the political systems that are being used? What are the legal systems? What are the legal ramifications? So these are the things to keep in mind when we are looking at expanding into those countries. Thanks again for being with me today and we hope to see you soon.